we're live. Hello and welcome. Happy New Year. Welcome to our eighth museum crawl. To date, we've armchaired traveled to museums in Turin, Hong Kong, Jaipur, Birmingham in the UK, and domestically to Puerto Rico, Cleveland, and Salem, Mass. Today, we're delighted to be visiting Santa Fe, New Mexico with our colleague at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, Dr. Ariel Plotek. I'm Catherine Evans, Deputy Director of Collections and Curatorial Strategies here at the Newark Museum of Art. To warm us up, I'm sharing three spectacular paintings by O'Keeffe in our collection. Here they are, an early abstraction on the left from 1919 and two extraordinary flowers, a frequent subject, petunias from 1925 in the middle, and the white flower on red earth number one from 1943. In all, they give us a spectacular picture of the arc of her remarkable career over three decades. Um, the next slide shows uh, two installation shots uh, that in 2019, we reinstalled our gallery on the left, formerly called Stieglitz and the 291 Circle and renamed to be inclusive and equitable to Stieglitz, O'Keefe and the 291 Circle. A quick note to say that you may post your questions in the chat if you're on Zoom and in the comments section if you're on Facebook. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Plotek. Since 2018, Ariel Plotek has served as the Curator of Fine Art at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. Prior to Santa Fe, Dr. Plotek was the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the San Diego Museum of Art, where he organized exhibitions of American, Latin, and American modernis modernism. He also has a background in 19th and 20th century modernism, having prepared his doctoral dissertation at NYU's Institute of Art, Fine Arts, under the supervision of luminaries, Linda Nochlin and Robert Rosenblum. Over to you, Ariel. Thank you very much, Catherine. I appreciate this invitation and a special thank you also to all the O'Keeffe Museum members that are joining us today. Uh, I wanted to speak today about uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's life in art and really to, um, to illustrate the way in which the, um, the mission, the purpose of our museum has evolved uh, since its founding in 1997. So we can move to the next slide. Now on the left, you see the, the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum building in downtown Santa Fe uh, in New Mexico. And uh, on the right, the O'Keeffe Welcome Center uh, in Abiquiu, New Mexico. Now the Welcome Center is a, is a recent addition, addition to, the, um, to the museum's uh, sort of constellation of uh, holdings. It is built uh, near O'Keeffe's house in, in Abiquiu. And, um, so one of the things that I want to sort of clarify from the, um, from the outset is the fact that O'Keeffe did not live uh, decades of her life in Santa Fe, but uh, at Abiquiu, uh, about an hour's drive from, from Santa Fe. And, um, and one of, the, of her homes there, the uh, home and studio in Abiquiu, is open now to visitors, to, to visitor tours uh, part of the year in, in, in normal years, shall we say. And, um, this, uh, this welcome center is, is as I say, it's a, it's a recent um, addition to, to greet our visitors with, um, with both collections material and um, full shop and, uh, and a sort of a point to, to orient visitors to the region as well, even those who are not taking a tour of the home. Now, the next slide. This is, uh, these are images of O'Keeffe's two homes in Northern New Mexico. On the left is the uh, Abiquiu Home and Studio. So the home near that welcome center I was just talking about, that is the home that is um, accessible now to our visitors who can, um, who uh, ordinarily can, can book tours of the um, inside and outside of the, of the house. And what you're seeing on the right is uh, an image of O'Keeffe's house at Ghost Ranch, um, a similar adobe structure 
And what you see in the background is a, a quite spectacular view of the Pedernal, um, this flat topped uh, Flint Mountain, which was O'Keeffe's view from her patio. Now, something I want to clarify um, is the, the relationship between these two houses. In fact, they are only about 20 minutes drive from one another. And um, so it is sometimes to con confusing to our visitors uh, why it is that O'Keeffe had these uh, two homes in such close proximity. Now, it was in fact, it was the ghost ranch house that O'Keeffe uh, purchased first, the house you see on the, um, on the right. It was a relatively uh, new construction when she bought it. And, um, and it sat on the, on the very edge of an enormous uh, property, um, Ghost Ranch proper. Now the Ghost Ranch um, was then operating as a, as a dude ranch, that is to say a, um, a functioning ranch, but one that really catered to, um, to visitors and, and tourists. And, um, and when O'Keefe um, purchased it, she was the only person residing like this um, in, the, in, the, in the midst of this uh, of this land, really, sort of as I say, it's it's kind of at the at the edge of the um, of the Ghost Ranch uh, property. The ranch is used today for um, for filming westerns and and the like. It's actually it's um, it is operated by the uh, Presbyterian Church, and um, and uh, and can be visited um, the ranch that is. But uh, O'Keeffe's home itself, unfortunately, is um, is sort of off limits for the time being. It's a very hard, difficult home to access. Uh, this would have been even more true in O'Keeffe's time. And uh, the ranch itself, the, the ground, the sort of badlands that surround it are fairly inhospitable. So there was no question of O'Keeffe ever being able to, um, to really live sort of sustainably as she liked, as she, as she um, wished to do uh, at the ranch. In contrast, the house on the, on the left at Abiquiu uh, had a uh, one acre garden that was, um, that with, uh, with water rights um, from the nearby uh, acequia, so a, a sort of an irrigation system that was used to, um, the, to uh, keep the, the, the abiquiu uh, garden extremely fertile. It produced enough um, produce for, for both the houses um, and, and in the way that O'Keefe used them, the abiquiu house became essentially a home for the uh, winter and spring and, um, and she'd be in Ghost Ranch in the, in the summers uh, and fall. Next image, please. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about how it is that O'Keeffe came to be in New Mexico because it seems appropriate to begin there um, since I think of our museum in Santa Fe being so much a sort of site-specific um, institution that really the, the virtue of visiting, uh, visiting our collection is not only seeing the works in the museum, but also uh, being able to appreciate them in this in this setting that was so very um, uh, important for O'Keeffe, this, this landscape. Um, what you're seeing here uh, are two images of the church, uh, Rancho de Taos. Um, a Taos is about a further uh, hour and a half from Santa Fe, and it's where uh, O'Keeffe first touched down in New Mexico when she made a visit, a very important visit, in 1929. Now, what you're seeing on the left it's a photograph by Ansel Adams of this church. Uh, Adams was in Taos in 1929, working on his first book, The Images of the Taos uh, Pueblo. And um, so he photographed this church uh, as along with the, the Pueblo itself and the, and the surrounding um, landscape. And, uh, and O'Keeffe in some ways followed suit. She painted this um, painting that you see on the right, I should say not in the O'Keeffe Museum's collection, the, the following year, she, she returned to, um, to New Mexico after 1929 in the summer of 1930. But let's focus first on that summer of 1929. So the next image, please. O'Keeffe had been living with Alfred Stieglitz in New York City for a little more than a decade at this time when she decided to, um, to get away, to break with the, the routine of these um, summers that were spent with Stieglitz at the Stieglitz family home in Lake George in upstate New York and travel instead to uh, Taos with her friend, Rebecca Strand. And so you see the two of them on the left around the time of their arrival in New Mexico in 1929. Um, the, this was a very, uh, it, was, it was a very important uh, summer for O'Keeffe. 
not only was it a sort of, did it give her some critical distance from Alfred Stieglitz, and we know quite a lot about uh, how their relationship was faring at this time from the, from the correspondence um, that, that is preserved, uh, but it also introduced her to a whole new range of subjects so that um, the, the vernacular architecture of the region, that, that Adobe church, for example, um, her first paintings of, um, of bones, skulls, um, the landscape itself with its um, with what O'Keefe described as the sort of veil of Catholicism that seems to um, to sort of uh, to, to, to permeate um, this part of New Mexico, crosses in the landscape and such. And um, she was also a guest of uh, Mabel Dodge Lujan, a quite a sort of, um, I guess we would say an, an important um, um, champion of, of modern artists and uh, who, who invited them to her home, Las Galos in, in Taos. So, um, so it's there again that O'Keefe met Ansel Adams. Um, it was there with Mabel's uh, husband, Tony Lujan, who was in fact a member of the Pueblo, uh, Taos Pueblo, that she learned to drive. And we see this photograph uh, on the right in 1929 of an O'Keefe who was just returned from the summer in New Mexico, um, photographed by Stieglitz at Lake George. And, and I love the sort of this um, slightly wry and defiant smile that we see on O'Keefe's lips. She's leaning here against the, the car that she's returned with. And, and I think in many ways proclaiming her, her independence at this moment. Uh, notably Stieglitz never makes the trip to, to New Mexico. So this is um, this really is a sort of beginning of their of their lives being lived apart, um, at least uh, during the summer months. Next image, please. Uh, here is a photograph by Adams, in fact, of an American place, Stieglitz's gallery, in 1931, and we see alongside um, abstractions not so unlike the painting in um, in uh, the Newark Museum collection, views of the landscape. Uh, in, in New Mexico. So we already see these kind of, um, how it's beginning to, to permeate her repertoire. Next image, please. Now this uh, jumping uh, ahead um, rather is a photograph from 1997 of the O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe as it looked when it first opened its doors to the public. Um, the, the building had undergone a renovation to make it, uh, to transform it into a, into a museum. Um, but we were still working, the, the museum was still working with the spaces that, more or less the spaces that it had inherited. And um, this is the largest of those. It's a, it's a gallery that uh, to this day um, is devoted to her New Mexico uh, subjects. So that kind of second chapter of her life after the years spent in New York. You see a painting in the, on that far baffle wall spring that is actually undergoing conservation right now at the museum. and. Um, and you can note as well the color of the walls, the sort of slightly uh, pinkish adobe tone that was that was first um, tried out again when the museum opened its doors. Um, this was quickly abandoned in favor of uh, white walls, which um, should be said is always what O'Keeffe had imagined her her paintings uh, hanging against. Next image, please. And I want to contrast this with um, the the museum today. This is. Um, a little snapshot of an exhibition that I organized. And this is, we're seeing in fact that same large gallery and a painting called My Last Door, one of the larger paintings in our collection that's visible in the background. And what you're seeing in the foreground is a sculpture by uh, Ken Price. And um, so when I, when I arrived at the museum, I was, um, I was inheriting a program that had begun um, well long before me of presenting contemporary artists at the museum, establishing a sort of dialogue between um, living artists or in Price's case, recently dead artists and, um, and the work of uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. And I came to the museum thinking really of, um, of Price as a, as a Taoist artist. He had um, spent many decades um, near, you know, again, not too very far from uh, Santa Fe in, at Arroyo Seco. And, um, and so I was, I was happy to be able to present his work um, at the museum, and this is an ongoing program. In fact, we will be, uh, when, when the, the pandemic um, permits, we will have an exhibition at the museum of um, the work of our first artist in residence, uh, an artist from Massachusetts, Josephine Halverson. And so this again speaks to the way in which we are very committed to, um, to sort of uh, asserting the, the relevancy of O'Keeffe's art 
um, not only uh, with the with the many visitors that come to the museum and um, and regard her as being a sort of modernist icon, perhaps of the last century, but also connecting her to, to artists uh, working today. Next image, please. Now, um, to speak of how O'Keeffe arrived at this sort of um, this kind of modernist um, place uh, really requires us to begin with um, a fairly conventional uh, arts education that O'Keeffe received both in New York and in Chicago. And we see an example of this on the left, um, a figure drawing from a sketchbook of around 1905 which uh, is a figure drawing that happened um, in the classroom with a life model and um, of, a fairly, of a fairly conventional kind. At the same time that O'Keeffe was learning um, to, to use, uh, to paint, especially with watercolors. As a student of William Merritt Chase, for example, she was really developing, um, she was developing that technique in particular. And um, by 1907, uh, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a little typo, that's supposed to be 1917. By 1917, however, we see um, quite a radical break with that uh, training that she had received. That drawing on the right is made uh, in Texas, watercolor, I should say, on the right. And uh, we, think of it, we think it to be a uh, self-portrait. And you see the way in which um, O'Keeffe is taking this virtuoso watercolor technique that she has indeed um, developed and using it in quite a radical way. She, um, in this case, for instance, she is, she's wetting the, the paper first to kind of achieve the contours that she wants. Um, and so thinking in these compositional terms and then returning with, with color and what is in fact a fairly uh, monochromatic palette to, um, to capture her own likeness. Uh, next slide, please. Now the, the white rose uh, on the left is a little closer in character and in date to the flower paintings or at least one of the flower paintings in the Newark collection. And um, it's a painting that hangs in our first gallery, a gallery that we use to talk about um, O'Keeffe and abstraction, because I think that is one of the, the challenges to some of our visitors is to understand how it is that, um, uh, that this sort of uh, notion of abstraction fairly, um, which was a fairly uh, new idea being developed both in, in Europe and um, in the United States at the, around the turn of the century was being um, employed by O'Keeffe and, uh, and really being sort of um, married with the observation of nature. So that one of the things that O'Keeffe teaches us um, in the 1920s is that we can think of abstraction as a, as a sort of spectrum with uh, on the one hand, paintings like some that she was making, in fact, the, the drawing that you see behind her in the photograph on the, on the right, that were indeed um, expressions of, of sort of um, the artist's um, compositions that were, that were derived from her imagination without direct reference to any uh, you know, observable uh, motif in nature. And then the uh, paintings of the flowers. And, uh, and then a painting like this one on the, on the left, Abstraction White Rose, which really, I think the title uh, already sort of communicates the way in which um, O'Keeffe is able to sort of toe the line between these two, um, these two uh, concepts. On the one hand, the way that she has abstracted the form of the flower, um, but nevertheless, it's referring to, to, this, um, to this natural uh, subject recognizable to many of her viewers. Um, I like also the way that she calls it a white rose and there's really every color but white um, used in this, in this painting. It's incredibly uh, nuanced um, use of color derived in part from her, um, her practice as a, uh, as a pastelist. And she continues to, to work with pastels um, in the 1920s. She'd really been an artist who worked on paper before beginning to exhibit with um, Alfred Stieglitz in New York and Stieglitz who seems to have convinced her that there was a market for paintings um, above all else. And, and she makes this sort of um, transition really to being a, a painter working with oil on canvas. Next image, please. Now I've talked a little about her life with Alfred Stieglitz in New York City and the way that they were dividing their time between uh, Lake George where we suppose um, uh, O'Keeffe painted those first paintings of flowers and, um, and the city itself where she does begin to, to embrace the sort of urban landscape as well in, um, in paintings of the, of the city and its skyline. Um, what we're seeing here is the, uh, not only the, the New York City skyline, but the, um, 
the, a view across the, uh, the East River. And um, in addition to the, to the smokestacks, we have to imagine the skyscrapers that were dotting the, the, cities, um, the city's sort of um, um, skyline at this time. And um, one of those was the building in which O'Keeffe and Stieglitz were residing, the, the Shelton Hotel. It's still a hotel, not called the Shelton anymore, but it's in midtown Manhattan. And um, at 30 some stories, it was the tallest residential hotel at the time when it opened its doors in the 1920s. And so what O'Keefe and uh, Stieglitz had from their, from their high perch at the top of this skyscraper was really a completely novel view of the, of the city. Uh, Stieglitz takes photographs from the window of the Shelton and O'Keefe not only makes um, drawings like this one, but, but paintings as well of the same, um, of the same motif. And we'll see that this, um, this sort of uh, embrace of new perspectives, of new points of view is something that really remains a sort of a, a late motif um, in not only in, in this work of the 20s and 30s, but in O'Keeffe's late life um, as well. There are paintings also, I should say, of the Shelton Hotel itself um, that O'Keeffe makes from the, um, from the sidewalk and views, views of, the, of the building, which, which, are, um, which are entirely different in character because we have the sense of the, of the sort of looming skyscraper and, the, um, and the, the, the way in which the human figure is dwarfed by the, by the modern city. But there was something very important about these skyscrapers um, for uh, modernists in the, in, uh, like O'Keefe and Stieglitz and the artists in his circle as quintessential representations of something that was um, truly American, that unlike the, um, the, the modernism in, uh, in painting that um, Stieglitz was both a, uh, a champion of when he, when he showed, for example, drawings by, um, by uh, Picasso at his gallery, um, this was something that the skyscraper seemed to be untainted by European associations. It was something tr truly American. And that was, um, that was a great importance to Stieglitz as well. On to the next slide. Now, um, in 1936, so when that drawing of, uh, of the East River was made, O'Keeffe was already dividing her time between New Mexico and New York. In 1936, O'Keeffe is here at, uh, at Ghost Ranch, and we have a view of that, um, of that Pedernal Mountain, what becomes a kind of touchstone um, for her, a motif she returns to time and again. Maybe it's because of my own background in, in uh, European modernism, but I think of, I think of um, Cezanne painting the Mont Saint-Victoire, for example, and the way in which certain uh, subjects for the generation of the Impressionists and post-Impressionists became uh, obsessions, uh, themes that were returned to time and again in paintings and series. And this can certainly be said of the, of the Pedernal Mountain, which O'Keeffe observes at different times of the year, different times of the day, and, um, and, and remains for her this sort of, um, this, this constant presence. Next slide, please. Now, the, um, the image uh, of O'Keeffe as the sort of, um, a, as a, as a Western uh, woman and a badass on the Badlands is, is partly created through photographs um, like this one by Ansel Adams. Um, O'Keeffe here, uh, this is actually near the house at Abiquiu. In 1937, she has gone out um, into the landscape and she's returned with some um, subjects to paint the, uh, you know, the bones, the, the skulls that became such a mainstay of her, of her uh, New Mexico um, subjects. And I, I, was, I wondered when I first moved here how it was that O'Keeffe had, um, had found so, so many um, of these bones and, and, and skulls and, and such uh, in the landscape. I'm told that the late 1920s had been a period of quite uh, severe drought. And so that was in part the reason that there were these carcasses just sort of um, uh, littering the landscape. And of course, uh, when friends got word that O'Keefe was collecting something, whether it was um, shells or stones or bones, um, they brought these to her offerings. And so I imagine that the collection grew quite a lot in that way as well. 
Um, this, this photograph also makes me think of the recent exhibition organized um, by Wanda Korn at Brooklyn, um, Living Modern, which focused not only on O'Keeffe as a painter, but really, um, really sort of explored the relationship between O'Keeffe's um, aesthetic in her art and the way that she lived um, writ large. So the furniture that she had at the homes um, in New Mexico, the, the clothing here, the what are probably some mm -hmm. Levi's um, dungarees and the, uh, the gaucho hat that became a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, an iconic part of her, of her wardrobe and was actually included in the exhibition that traveled from, uh, from Brooklyn. Next slide, please. Now I've talked about the, these uh, novel perspectives and there's perhaps no better example of this than the, um, the view from the airplane that O'Keeffe began to, uh, to explore, to represent beginning in the 1950s after Alfred Stieglitz's death when she moved uh, permanently to, uh, to New Mexico. So after, after sort of settling his estate in New York, she returns to, um, to the homes of Ghost Ranch and Abiquiu and, um, and she begins really to travel in earnest, to travel internationally. Um, she travels around the world and has, of course, um, the view from the, from the um, portal of the, uh, of the airplane, which is one that she's unlike anything she's ever seen before. And, um, and she begins to sketch it and to paint it. Um, I suppose most famously, this, uh, this series of paintings led to the mural that hangs today in Chicago. And um, we have a painting from this series, Above the Clouds One, um, at the uh, O'Keeffe Museum. And the, you can see the, here again, there's a kind of an abstracting of the, of the motif as she returns time and again to the subject. So that the um, painting in Chicago has clouds that look very much like, um, like sort of uh, marshmallows. I mean, they've, they've really become a, a kind of a, just a sort of compositional uh, trope rather than, than the, um, shall we say, maybe the more um, naturalistic observation of this phenomenon that we see here with these clouds like skipping stones over the, over the, uh, the earth below. Uh, next slide, please. I've talked about this travel and I wanted to illustrate it with one of two paintings that we have in our collection of Mount Fuji. Uh, O'Keeffe first traveled to Japan as part of a um, of a round the world organized tour. It's kind of it's it's it tickles me to imagine O'Keeffe as part of a sort of package group tour. But indeed, um, she tagged along uh, with all of these sort of um, fellow travelers. There there are great photographs of, of them um, in the uh, you know in the, in the deserts of North Africa and um, and also. Here, uh, this is what would have been, I suppose, a highlight of the of the visit to Japan that O'Keeffe first made in nineteen um, in 1960. The the view of Mount Fuji, um, once more, a, a very sort of um, reduced, we might say, a kind of an abstracted treatment of this composition. The the silhouette of the mountain standing against a, a pink uh, sky. This actually is, the, is a painting that was recently, that underwent conservation at the uh, O'Keeffe Museum uh, as well. So it's looking, it's looking better than, than ever. Um, and, and it also, it, it makes us think, um, and this is, again, I have in mind that recent exhibition, um, which uh, placed O'Keeffe's art in dialogue with her clothing, um, notably the, the kimonos that she collected and some of those in fact were purchased in Japan. And um, what was really for O'Keeffe a, a sensibility that seemed to be very allied with, um, with Japanese aesthetics long before she ever visited Japan. Um, however, having returned from the trip, she, she begins to do things like uh, she has the, the hedges at, um, at the house in Abiquiu. Uh, the juniper bushes are, are, are trimmed a little like bonsais. And so there's this kind of, there is a, um, more than ever, there is this sort of appreciation of, um, of Japanese style. What we're seeing on the left is a very late work of O'Keeffe's. This is the, among the latest works in our collection, a watercolor from the 1970s. And it should be noted that late in life, O'Keeffe's vision begins to fail her. She is suffering from uh, macular degeneration. And so she retains in fact her, her peripheral vision but loses her central sight. 
And um, so as you can imagine, this very much impacts her ability to, to paint, uh, to draw. In fact, she has made the acquaintance um, around this time of uh, Juan Hamilton, who is her assistant and um, who is himself a, a ceramic uh, artist, ceramic sculptor. And he begins to, he encourages her to explore uh, working in clay. And she makes, um, she makes ceramic vessels. We have some of those in our collection. And, um, but she also returns to, uh, to watercolor in some ways where her, where her um, life as an artist had begun. You recall that I was saying that she was really a, an artist who, who worked on paper um, before the, she develops this relationship with Alfred Stieglitz. And um, so these watercolors that are quite large of the 1970s were painted uh, with the help of an assistant. So she was, she was, um, she was aided in, uh, in working um, again on this, on this relatively large scale. And um, what's striking is the way that she returns once more to, um, to motifs that were so very close to her from the, um, from the beginning of her, of her career. So when she is in fact an art teacher in Texas, uh, she paints watercolors of the, of the open plains. Um, the same is true when she travels at that time to, to Colorado and she is sort of uh, enamored of the mountains and valleys she sees there. And um, so we have a sort of a, a coming um, full circle in a sense, which I think is a, is a good place perhaps for me to, um, to end my slideshow and, uh, and open things up a little bit. I think Catherine, you're perhaps muted. So sorry, <laughs> I should know that by now. Thank you so much for taking us on that journey uh, to sort of understand O'Keeffe's journey. And uh, that was fascinating. So um, I think we have some questions. Uh, I'm going to see if I can field them. Uh, Let's see, it says the chat is disabled. Oh dear. Um, so from Debbie, we have, uh, are all of these museum events sponsored by Newark Museum? Oh, well, thank you, Debbie. Yes, uh, I would like to keep updated on these events. Well, that's great to know. And yes, uh, you may sign up on our email list on our website and be updated about all of our programs. Uh, I'll mention a couple in a minute, but uh, let's see if we can get this, uh, q and A is going about the, this particular program. Um, hmm, let's see. I'm not seeing. Uh, ah, there's a couple here. Okay, from Kathy, where is the Taos Church painting now? That, that painting I'm showing you uh, is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. Ah, wonderful. It does, belong, it does belong to a series. So there are others like it. None, unfortunately, in the in the collection of the O'Keeffe Museum, although we do have pencil drawings that relate to that uh, to that subject. Uh, let's see. Uh, from Richard, did she camp out in the wilderness for multiple days on painting expeditions? She did. I was just talking a, a moment ago about her time in Texas and uh, and in, and traveling in Colorado as well. And she was camping at that time. So we have. Um, we have sketches and, and uh, even paintings that are that are made representing the uh, the parted flaps of a tent uh, a tent door, and mm -hmm. um, and so we we ha and we have photographs of her uh, hiking and camping with friends and the, the photographs are great because of course you're seeing them in what looks like yes you know, it's, it's turn of the century uh, hiking attire yeah. <laughs> very minimal <laughs> correct yeah, no, no gear <laughs> so. Uh, um, so yeah, thank you. Um, we, uh, let's see, was her car called Hello? And was that the car in the picture? Oh, the, the I, I have not heard that about the, about the Ford that we see in the picture. But one thing I wanna mention that relates to, the, to that earlier uh, question we had a moment ago is that she does, um, in fact, th th there's a time in New Mexico when she outfits her car as a painting studio. So she actually has one of the seats removed, so it affords her a little more space to work, and um, and she's able to sort of shelter from the you know from the hot sun um, while painting uh, on plein air. I, I think it should be noted though that those are mostly sketches that that the the paintings are not um, by and large they're not executed 
uh, out of doors. They'd be, they'd be finished in the studio. From Aaron, we have uh, a question. Is there a definitive biography of O'Keefe that you recommend? Well, well, I won't recommend any, any one in particular. Um, there are some very good ones um, available. One thing though that I will signal is the way that, um, that O'Keefe's, uh, our understanding of O'Keefe's life uh, changed um, at the time when her, her, um, her letters were made uh, available to, to scholars. So O'Keefe had asked that the letters and, and uh, those letters were given to the Beinecke Library at, uh, at Yale that they be um, held there for 25 years after her death before, um, before they'd be, you know, what is in many cases actually some very um, personal and intimate correspondence was made available to scholars. And um, it's very striking to read the biographies that, that predate that, um, you know, that, that sort of uh, our access to that material and then uh, more recent ones. And, uh, but what I will say is that if you go to the O'Keefe um, Museum website, and, uh, and visit our library um, page, there is there, there's a, a suggestion of, um, of reading material. So that'll give you good recent biographies and, uh, and more. Wonderful. Um, an anonymous uh, person submitted this question. How is O'Keefe's work viewed in Japan? And are there many of her works in Japanese museums or in private collections? That's a very good question. Uh, there has been there's been a real appetite for um, an O'Keefe exhibition in Japan, and um, I've been trying. Well, I'm relatively new to the museum. Um, I'll have been there um, well less than three years in Santa Fe, and uh, but already in the time that I've been um, at the O'Keefe, we've been talking to uh, Japanese venues about organizing an exhibition. There is um, there is a real. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a great. Uh, there's a great knowledge of her work, uh, but there is a sense among curators and exhibition organizers that there would be um, a great interest that this would be. And, and in fact, um, an idea that I've had and I'm, I'm trying to develop um, is to focus on O'Keefe uh, in Japan and that Japanese, um, that sort of Japanese aesthetic that I've been talking about, which really, um, you know, long predates her visit to the country. Yeah. She was she was reading. Um, the, the sort of treatise, the textbook of uh, Arthur Wesley Dow as a, um, as a student and, and, and um, a new teacher of art in the, in the 19 teens. And um, Dow was, was hugely enamored of um, Japanese woodblock prints, of Japanese composition, um, you know, following a little bit in the footsteps of, of the Impressionists and others uh, sure. in the West who had, who had collected those. Yeah, very, very uh, popular at the time, the, the Japanese one, but it's uh, yeah, fascinating. I also feel that the, the rest of the world is, has become interested in American modernists in general, whether it's Hopper or um, O'Keefe, uh, certainly. Um, so how many paintings did she complete in her lifetime? This is from, jo uh, from George, and is there a book specifically on her drawings? Those are good questions. The, the catalog resume um, has uh, well over a thousand paintings mm -hmm. and um, that is not a, a complete um, record. We were able to, you know, to add to that uh, newly discovered works, works that were mentioned perhaps um, as being part of an exhibition, an exhibition um, in New York or elsewhere that, uh, that are still unidentified. And um, and the works on paper are also included in that, um, in that catalog resume. So that complete uh, catalog of all known works by O'Keefe. I would point you, however, if you're interested in O'Keefe's work on paper to a catalog um, that was printed to accompany an exhibition of O'Keefe's work in Texas. And, um, and it features uh, those, the watercolors like the one that I showed you, the, um, the, the self-portrait. And, and I really consider those, um, those watercolors of the teens to be just uh, among the, um, the treasures of, of our museum's uh, collection and, and really as, um, as remarkable, not only uh, sort of technically as, as the work of any uh, watercolorist to find in the, in the 20th century, but also she is, she's so very ahead of, um, of her time in her embrace of abstraction. So you know, 
let's say that it, around 1915, when some very few um, artists in Europe are beginning to um, experiment with a kind of all over um, abstraction, making a real break from um, representation. Partly, many, many of them are looking to, to music as a source of inspiration. Um, O'Keeffe has read, in fact, uh, parts of uh, Vasily Kandinsky's treatise on the spiritual and art and is, and is um, responding in part to those same ideas. But she's doing this really um, well ahead of, of, um, of, the, of the pack. Uh, you know, there are very, there are very few Americans. Uh, who are... There's some fascinating questions and people chiming in from uh, around the world. Uh, I want to just uh, mention a note from uh, Bridget. Uh, she's in Cork, Ireland. I won't try to pronounce the first part of that uh, location. Uh, location of the old chieftainship of the O'Keefe clan, a rather wet environment. Mm -hmm. The dairy cows are still here and the moon was rising as you were speaking. Well, thank you, Bridget. Thank um, you. <laughs> there's another uh, gentleman, Purvis, from Scotland. What is your favorite artwork and what was your first exposure to her work? The skulls were my first exposure. Well, I would say that the, the paintings that I, and works on paper that I really got to know um, best uh, first were works at the San Diego Museum of Art. And um, Catherine, you mentioned in your introduction, that's where I, where I was um, serving previously. And uh, San Diego has five works by O'Keeffe in their collection. Um, one of which is a, is a pastel of a, of a seashell that is an absolutely exquisite object. Unfortunately, because the works on paper are light sensitive, it wasn't shown very often. Mm -hmm. But um, that was really my first sort of intimate, uh, you know, contact with, with the works. And um, also they were among the most requested of any work in that museum's collection. I think many people can, I'm sure Catherine, you can attest to this too, yeah. that there are, that we receive frequent requests um, to lend yeah. our own. And, um, and so I traveled with those um, really all over the world. And that's how I got to know the, the staff at the O'Keeffe Museum in the first place. A uh, fascinating question or a comment here from Gary. I have read brown green color blindness and have found O'Keeffe works to be most wonderful to see. Have you ever heard that before? Well, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting you should bring that up. And I wish that I had, um, that I had uh, my colleague Katrina Latka on the call right now, because she could tell us a little bit more. Uh, Katrina works, um, is our curator of education interpretation. And it's really uh, thanks to an initiative from that department that we have brought um, these, uh, these um, glasses to the, to the museum that are designed for, uh, that are designed to, to, to address uh, red, green color blindness and not in every um, person, but in some uh, do allow people who have formerly um, not been able to, to, to see those colors to, um, to perceive them. And yeah. so they were, and they were very generously given to the museum. And so we're able to make those um, available to our visitors. Terrific. Well, that's a great way to provide access. Um, a comment from Vivian Green in her era, were her paintings considered by critics to be somewhat intimate of a woman's genitalia? Oh. I, uh, I think that is, I think we can all say yes. Um, but do you have anything further to say there? Well, I wanna just harken back to that, the, um, contrast that I, um, I made between the painting of the, um, the abstraction white rose and the photograph by Alfred Stieglitz, because it is notable that um, photographs like the one that I showed, I think she's, she's in a sort of, um, you know, she, she's dressed in some sort of uh, uh, camisole in that particular um, photograph, but there are others that Stieglitz took of, um, of O'Keeffe uh, that are nude. Sometimes, in fact, they're just sort of isolated parts of her, her body. Um, but but those uh, photographs like those were shown by Stieglitz um, at his gallery alongside O'Keeffe's paintings. Um, not surprising, perhaps, that when critics saw these paintings, um, the very large flowers that, that were unlike anything that um, that artists in America had shown before, um, they were they were perplexed. They were trying to make sense of this um, of these uh, subjects, and they they drew they sort of drew their own conclusions about what was um, clearly uh, the work of a woman who, who had made herself um, a, a kind of a subject for, for, uh, for Stieglitz, who, who becomes her husband in 1924, and, um, and who continues to sort of to photograph her. Altogether, 
there are some 300 photographs or, or more that Stieglitz takes. And um, I think that is a part of it. Well, we're running out of time and there's still plenty of questions. Thank you all so much for your participation and your great uh, questions. Uh, I'll conclude with uh, the, an obvious one. Is the museum open in Santa Fe? Alas, we're not open right now. Okay. Um, we, we reopened for a, for a brief time in the fall and we hope to, to open again very soon. Wonderful. Well, like many museums across the country, including ours, uh, uh, so impacted by the pandemic. Um, I want to just conclude by saying if you enjoyed this program, please consider donating to the museum so we can continue our very robust uh, offerings of virtual programs. Uh, as I mentioned, you may sign up on our email list or check out hashtag NMOA at home and see uh, subscribed register for any and all programs. Coming up, uh, ask an astronomer, something very different. A cosmic perspective, searching for aliens, finding ourselves happens on Tuesday, February 2nd at noon. And on Saturday, February 13th, we have our all day virtual multilingual celebration of Carnival as one of our community days. I wanna give a big shout out to the learning engagement team here as well as at the O'Keeffe Museum for all the behind the scenes work uh, to present these programs. Um, again, thank you, Ariel, for sharing your museum and your vast knowledge with us today and to all of you for uh, joining us. My great pleasure, thank you.